Hi everyone. Oh wait, one sec. Hi everyone. Welcome back to season two, episode five. While they forgot to say to the Murder Tapes podcast, I think my brother and his best friend Max did a pretty good job on the intro. Maybe I'll let them do it from now on. Let me know what y'all think. Anyways, shout out to them along with one of our listeners, Joanna. I appreciate all of your support so much and I'm so happy that you guys love the show. I really hope that I can soon start releasing two episodes a week once I graduate and stop working full time. Today we're going to be talking about the Jeanette De Palma case. It isn't a super popular one, which is pretty insane to me considering how scary it is. On September 19, 1972, in Springfield, New Jersey, a woman noticed her dog had just returned from a wooded area with something in its mouth. She went to go see what it was because her dog began playing with it on the lawn. As she approached, she realized that it was a human arm. She began to scream and called the Springfield Police Department. Before we continue, could you imagine how traumatizing that must have been to not only see the arm, but to see that your dog has it in its mouth? I really don't think that that's something I could ever recover from. An officer named Jay Schwert would recall what he saw when he arrived at the home. Quote, She took me to the rear door of her apartment and in a bluish bag, she handed me the arm of a female. The lower left arm, on the fingernails was a whitish nail polish. Not too long after police arrived, search parties began investigating the Hudai quarry behind the apartment building. They quickly came across an upper arm bone along with the rest of the corpse. The victim was face down and fully clothed in a small clearing on top of a steep hill called Devil's Teeth. Officer Jay Schwert would also say, quote, Around the body were logs across the head, down the right side, and a small branch under both feet. To put this into perspective, her body was surrounded by sticks that were formed into the outline of crosses and a coffin. As always, all illustrations and evidence will be linked in the show notes. You can also find the images on our Instagram at Murder Tapes Podcast. I'm the one who found the body, Schwartz said. He also said that this case still stands out in his memory. Quote, It was hard. I have five daughters and this could have been one of my daughters, you know? When I got up there, the body was lying right there. She had tan pants and a navy blue shirt. Somebody had to be with her because she had flip-flops on. And I had hiking boots on. And I had trouble getting up that little hill up to where she was laying. The chief medical examiner, Bernard Ehrenberg, pronounced the unidentified girl as dead. Luckily, dental records were able to identify the 16-year-old girl. And her name was Jeanette De Palma. She had been reported missing by her mom for six weeks, and it was added in the newspaper that police believed that she had been dead for about six weeks, meaning she was more than likely killed that day she went missing or not too long after. Ehrenberg wrote in his medical examiner's report, quote, she was found lying face down with a rock formation surrounding her body. A skeletal examination along with x-rays showed no evidence of fractures, bullet holes, or traumatic injury. He also stated that an autopsy couldn't be performed because of the Mark state of decomposition. This is also why the cause of death could not be determined and it was labeled as suspicious rather than a homicide. The crime lab reported that her clothing, including her shirt, pants, and underwear were tested along with the soil at the scene in order to be compared to hairs collected. But no foreign hairs were found and the stains that were on her clothing and underwear were too degraded for blood and semen testing. It's important to note that DNA testing was not available during this time, but her clothing has been preserved for all of these years. Unfortunately, no one was ever arrested in connection with her death. There have also not been any new leads, but we will get into this later. So who was Jeanette De Palma? She was a 16-year-old girl that lived on Clearview Road in the upper-class neighborhood of Springfield. Her family was very well-respected, and she was described by others as being outgoing and happy. Jeanette was very committed to Christianity, active in her community, and often spent time with her close friends. She disappeared on August 7, 1972, just four days after she turned 16. She had left her home in Springfield after telling her mom that she was going to take a train to her friend's house. However, some people believe that she may have hitchhiked because she never arrived at her friend's house or back home. Thankfully, her parents reported her missing the very next day. We will see in most cases that people wait way too long to report people missing, so they did the right thing. So what theories are there? Well, at the time, there were reports of devil worship. This included locals sharing their experiences with seeing children holding seances, sacrificing chickens, and praying to Satan. There had also been dead goats found in the Wachung Reservation. This was, of course, combined with the fact that her body had been found on 
the hill called Devil's Teeth and the way her body was found. These were just some of the news headlines. Murder probe sheds light on witchcraft cult. Jersey murder probe throws light on witchcraft. Priest's theory. Devil's disciples killed girl. And occult symbols reportedly surrounded body. Witchcraft implicated in De Palma murder. The Associated Press also reported that authorities said her death may have been linked to a coven or witchcraft assembly thought to exist in the area. Springfield Police Chief George Parcel was also quoted for saying, Springfield Police Chief George Parcel was also quoted for saying, I heard that some people from the department supposedly brought a witch out there to help with the investigation, but I know nothing about it. Another important thing to note is that the pastor of her church named Reverend James Tate said he believes Satanists captured and killed the teen because of her faith. Quote, she was so religious that she would often talk to friends and acquaintances about God. He also told reporters that in the past, Jeanette tried to lecture devil worshippers about Christ and quote, their fantasism arose and they killed her. But while he is also religious, others that aren't shared the belief that her faith could have been the reason someone killed her. This was a popular theory because of the way her body was found and because her murder occurred during the Jesus movement. I'm going to be directly quoting from Encyclopedia's article on it in order to describe what this movement was. The Jesus movement refers to a communally oriented fundamentalist Christian movement that developed in the 1960s and 70s among relatively affluent young people in the United States. Early Jesus movement groups attracted considerable media attention and became the focus of some Christian religious leaders who were concerned about whether or not such groups were truly Christian. Well-publicized lifestyle practices that included long hair and casual dress contributed to the controversy, as did overt efforts to proselytize other young people. The movement gained much attention for about three decades and spread to other countries, becoming worldwide in scope. One controversial Jesus movement group, the Children of God, at one time had outposts in nearly 200 countries. The movement lost momentum in the 1990s, and by the early 2000s, only a few Jesus movement groups, such as Jesus People USA, Centered in Chicago, and The Family, formerly known as the Children of God, were still in existence. Remnants of some Jesus movement groups joined Pentecostal churches such as Calvary Chapel, a new denomination that has many features akin to the Jesus movement. Most participants in early Jesus movement groups were heavily involved with drugs, alcohol, tobacco, and premarital sex prior to joining. Participation in the Jesus movement usually led to dramatic behavioral changes, with the notion of getting high on Jesus seeming to serve as a replacement for previous activities. The Jesus movement seems to have served as a halfway house for many participants who had become disaffected from normal society and were involved with dissipated lifestyles. I found an article from the Northampton Chronicle and Echo that shares the story of Philippa Muller, who had family in the Jesus movement. Before we get into her story, I want to thank her for waiving her right to anonymity in order for us to hear the story. She spent her early life in Woking, Surrey with her parents and siblings. Her parents sold everything they owned, including their homes, in order to join Noel Stanton's Jesus Army in the 80s, after her parents met a couple that was recruiting from the church. They also put all of their money into a common fund. I would be so terrified as a child if my mom did something like this, but nevertheless, her and her family resided in a communal house with about 15 other people when she was just five years old. She mentions that her childhood still felt as it did before until Pastor Shanton became very strict. When she was caught drawing nude scribbles underneath the stairs, she was hauled into a quiet room with a fireplace and a community elder was told to cast demons out of her. Quote, you couldn't talk about anything to do with your body. It would be seen as indecent to do so. It was seen as sinful. Women and girls were there to serve only, serve the elders and the men in the community. Women had to wear ankle-length skirts for modesty, and you weren't supposed to show your ears. It was seen as sinful. Unfortunately, she was molested by two teenage boys at a young age, but she never reported it because she didn't think anyone would believe her. She would say, quote, We didn't have a voice to question. There was also another incident when she saw another member being molested by an elder that was later jailed for the sexual abuse. The people in the community shunned her for speaking about it, and she had to sit through a sermon that focused on liars. They used this sermon to humiliate her, and she decided to leave when she was 18. 
She had no money, but it was better than staying there. She goes on to say that everyone's clothing was communal. Birthdays were labeled as honoring days, and each household was judged in a league table format. Those that were considered to be the worst performing houses were visited by what they call a fire team. Outsiders were labeled as worldlings. She also said, quote, I remember having to ask permission to revise for my GCSE exams because of the continuous routine of meetings throughout the week. Education was not encouraged. It was seen as the way to material wealth, which was evil. I remember lying in bed at night and worrying about the drug addicts who were sharing my dormitory bedroom. I was 10 years old. Bad things were done in an environment that was meant to be Christian and godly, but those things were allowed to happen because there was no safeguard in place. We operated outside of society. We were drawing in people, then encouraging them to behave in a way that was so ungodly. There are a lot of damaged people out there that need to be acknowledged. The abuse wasn't just sexual, it was physical, it was financial, it was spiritual. I spent my entire upbringing based on one man's interpretation of the Bible. She is now 38 and still recalls all of the horrible encounters that she had. I am going to link this article if you're interested in more information about her case. There are also lots of stories similar to hers that took place during this movement. The police also believe that Jeanette may have accidentally overdosed on drugs or committed suicide, but the evidence also didn't support this theory. A 59-year-old man named Edward Salzano, who also grew up in Springfield, said, quote, An evil group of Satanists killed Jeanette. He was a close friend of her nephew named John Blancy that lived with his aunt when Jeanette died. He recalls them both trying to solve the case after police reached a dead end. John Blancy died four years ago, which made him want to try and solve the case, though he had never met her. He told the Daily Beast that he spoke with Jeanette's friends, family, and fellow acquaintances. He said he found that everyone was scared to death and he was not sure why, but he believes that there's a giant cover-up taking place. He also said, quote, They wanted to kill someone, a child, for Halloween, and that's why they did it. Quote, There was a really bad group of people here in town. There was some evil stuff going on here and there was a lot of people caught up in it and LSD was basically introduced for the first time. Another interesting find was that one of Jeanette's girlfriends was involved in the cult and maybe even her death. She would call me in the middle of the night, he said. One thing that she never stopped talking about was the satanic cult. Jeanette was set up. There were rumors that a transient who worked nearby, a watchman, and a man that drove a red Ford may have committed the murder, but police didn't connect any of these people with the crime. Springfield Police John Cook told the Daily Beast that the case has not received any new evidence. Quote, what I can say on this case right now is that it is still an active case of a suspicious death, and there has not been any new evidence as of yet to be able to officially rule it as a homicide. Salzano unsuccessfully sued the Union County Prosecutor's Office in hopes of getting the agency to test De Palma's clothing and fingernail scrapings for DNA. He said, quote, we need to establish a cause of death by making the x-rays public, and advanced DNA testing needs to be done. We have heard everything about how she died, from strangulation, to being shot with an arrow, to being bashed in the head. An independent body other than the county's office needs to go over it. The major reason her murder cannot be investigated and solved is because there is no determined cause of death. So her case is still ruled a suspicious death. This horrible murder will never be solved until the first step is taken. Jeanette had just turned 16 and was a sweet, loving person who believed in God and was brutally murdered and left in the woods to rot. And we want justice for Jeanette De Palma before it's too late. Springfield's Deputy Mayor Chris Weber, who is also a retired Newark police officer and detective, said he too spoke with the Springfield Police Chief Cook about taking another look into De Palma's case. Quote, a set of new eyes and a fresh perspective always helps either confirm or question case information. I don't think this was the perfect crime. Somewhere, something, some connection is out there waiting to be found and that will be the break in the case. Over the past few years of being a township official, I have had several people ask me about the case. They always have interest in it or they have a remembrance of the time it happened and some of the stories they have heard over the years. I believe any law enforcement officer would have the same desire to be able to have a case as important as this one finally solved. That's why we become cops. Another theory was that her death was the work of a serial killer because of four other murders that took place in the area, but there were no similarities found. However, there was a serial killer in the 70s named Richard Cottingham. 
that preyed on young girls and women. He was a family man that lived in a middle-class neighborhood in New Jersey and worked as a computer operator for the Blue Cross Blue Shield of New York. He is known as the Torso Killer. Ever heard of him? He claims to have killed between 85 and 100 young women before he was caught. He would torture, rape, and brutally kill his victims before dumping their bodies in wooded areas not too far from where Jeanette was found. It is theorized that she may have been hitchhiking before being abducted and murdered by him. A year before Jeanette was murdered, a man named John List planned on murdering his family. He ended up shooting his wife, mother, and two children in the head one by one. He then drove his son home from a soccer game and shot him in the chest and face multiple times. In order to clean up, he then placed all of their bodies on sleeping bags and lined them up on the bathroom floor of his Victorian mansion. He did end up leaving his mom in her apartment attic, however. All of the victims were undiscovered for a month. List had changed his identity and moved to Virginia until he was arrested in 1989. After his arrest, an article was written by the United Press International in April of 1990. The doctor that examined him said the husband-turned-murderer had lost his job and told the jury in Union County Superior Court, quote, Liss believed doing what he did to his family was allowed because he was sending them to join God and saving them from the embarrassment of having to be on the public dole. Before we move on, I do want to mention that this is strangely more common than you think. I'll soon cover more cases of familicide, but researchers have found that most of them are committed by men. This is because they really do think they're doing what's best for their family, and because they are given the role of being a provider, this is the only way out. However, in most cases of familicide, the perpetrator also ends up killing themselves so that they can forever be with their families. At least that's what they assume. Another term that is used to describe this type of crime is family annihilators. While we aren't 100% sure of his intentions, it's important to consider the different reasons he may have committed this crime. In other words, he may have just killed his family just because he wanted to, because he wanted to start over, or because he did genuinely think that it was better if they didn't have to suffer. His defense attorney, Elijah Miller Jr., also tried to introduce testimony that lists 16-year-old daughter Patricia was a practicing witch but the judge named William Weatherheimer barred the testimony from the court. He was then convicted of five counts of murder and was sentenced to five consecutive life sentences in 1990. He died in prison in 2008. Unfortunately, there was also another murder that took place in New Jersey that terrified the community. Patrick Michael Newell was 20 years old when his two friends bound his arms and legs behind his back before throwing him into a sand pit in Millville. They waited for him to drown, according to the 1971 article published in the New York Times. A friend of his told authorities that he belonged to a Satan-worshipping group and felt that he needed to die violently in order to be put in charge of 40 leagues of demons. He claims that Newell, quote, urged the two friends to bind him, which they did performed a satanic ritual, and then had him pushed into a pond. The criminal investigation section of the New Jersey State Police were then sent to investigate the possible existence of a voodoo cult. The two teens that participated were convicted of the murder. So these are all of the theories associated with her murder. And as I mentioned earlier, there have not been any new findings in this case, and it still remains unsolved. There's a Facebook page called Justice for Jeanette De Palma that is run by Salzano, and its main goal is to get more information in order to solve the case. I really hope Jeanette and her family can get justice eventually. This case is so heartbreaking. I will also be linking that along with all of the other evidence in the show notes. If you or someone you know has any information about the Jeanette De Palma case, please contact the Union County Prosecutor's Office at 908-527-4500. Feel free to follow our Instagram at Murder Tapes Podcast or my personal at Annalisa. Thank you so much for listening. If you like the show, please leave a review as it helps out so much, and I hope to see you on the next one.